<clears throat> All right, well, this morning we're going to continue in the book of Acts. I already told you we're going to see an example of Paul's preaching in the synagogue to a Jewish audience. And his sole purpose is going to be to evangelize them, right? If, um, if somebody doesn't know the Lord, that's the first thing that should come into our minds is they need the Lord, they need Christ. And that Jesus has commissioned us, he has told us that we need to try to reach them if we can. Okay, so that's what we see. Of course, that's what the missionary journeys were all about, but let's not forget that um, this evangelism was not just going on in, in, this, in these missions. It was going on everywhere, you know, in, in Judea, Samaria, um, you know, just everywhere the, the disciples were going, they were sharing the truth about Christ. So anyway, let, let's pick up the narrative in Acts 13, beginning in verse 13, which I read last time just to remind us that for some reason John Mark abandoned them. Perhaps, again, the difficulties of doing this work was... Was too, diff was too hard. Um, because of that, Paul's not going to want to take him on the next missionary journey, the second journey, and that's where he and Barnabas are going to part ways. But let's not forget that God was still able to use him. That is John Mark, because he did repent, and he did, as it were, shore up those areas where he was weak, and the Lord eventually used him to write one of the four Gospels, right? So um, he was you know, powerfully used by the Lord, even though he failed here. All right, so beginning in verse 13. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with, with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers neither uh, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, 
you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, take heed so that the things spoken, of, uh, spoken uh, of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath, and when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Well, that's a rather lengthy passage, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to, to get it all in, in this one uh, time together. But I, what I want us to see here is not so much what all these details are actually referring to, although I do want to touch on those things but just rather the methodology that Paul is following in reaching out to the Jews. Now, last time we, we saw Paul and Barnabas ordained to missionary work. Now, we, we saw something very important taking place in Antioch, that the church there desired to serve the Lord. They were wanting His direction as to how they might best serve Him, and so they sought Him. They worshipped him. They ministered to him. Remember the word we saw means that they did, they were basically seeking him through singing, praising, praying, and of course, searching the scriptures. And as they did these things, the Spirit gave them that direction. Remember the Spirit spoke. And he told them to set Saul and Barnabas apart that he might send them on the, the first missionary journey. Now, I know that we don't often think about worship in this way. We usually think of it more as something that, that God basically does. We look at it as something that is for us, okay, rather than for God. But that's not really the way it is, is it? Because we gather together to worship the Lord because He calls us to, because He's worthy, because we should express our love and our adoration for Him. The Lord is pleased when we gather and worship Him, when we spend time with Him, telling Him that He is beautiful, that He is perfect, how much we love Him, how thankful we are for all that He has done for us, especially for what He has done for us through His Son. Now, we do need to remember that God doesn't need this worship, that God is perfectly blessed without our worshiping Him. Okay. We are the ones who actually need this worship. He doesn't need it, but it's actually for Him that we gather. And as we minister to Him, He ministers to us. He gives to us what we need, which is the strength of the Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, exactly what we see Him give to the saints in Antioch. Now, we also saw what happened in Cyprus, which is the first stop in the missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas landed on the east side, and, and again, you'll notice I'm switching between Saul and Paul. It's the same person. I'm going to call him Paul from here on out. <laughs> they landed on the east side of the island. They worked their way across the island, going to all the various synagogues and cities uh, until they reached the capital city of Paphos. And that's where the Roman consul, remember, proconsul, wanted to hear their message. But there was a false prophet by the name of Elymas who tried to stop him from listening. And we, this reminded us that, that there is a very real spiritual enemy who is at work behind the scenes trying to stop others from listening to the gospel. And that enemy, of course, is the devil, Satan. He is a very real being, a very real person. Now, he's not only going to try to stop people from listening to us, he's also going to try to stop us from sharing the gospel with others in the first place. And he doesn't start to try to stop us when we begin to evangelize, 
He starts that work much earlier by attempting to keep us away from the very things that the Lord has given to strengthen us, which is prayer and worship and the study of His Word. He knows that if He can keep us from these things, that He has already won the battle. We're already neutralized. We're already on the sidelines. So we need to be careful and we need to be worshiping. We need to know how He works so that we can be on our guard against Him. We need to put on the full armor of God, not only to be able to stand against His attacks, but also to be able to overcome Him. Now remember, not only did Elymas fail to lead the proconsul astray, the Lord took away his sight so that he might open the proconsul's eyes. Interesting, isn't it? He judged Elymas so that he might show grace to the Roman proconsul. You realize that Elymas was, was a Jewish false prophet. So he basically judged one of the Jews, one of his own covenant people who was you know, far away from the Lord, that he might bring this Gentile to faith in Christ. When the proconsul saw what God did to Elymas, he believed. Now, this morning, we see Paul and Barnabas sail from Paphos to Perga. So, basically, from one port on the island of Cyprus, which is below the mainland, to the mainland, so directly north, to Perga. And then they travel over some, I guess, rather difficult mountainous areas to get up to a city by the name of Pisidian Antioch, which means Antioch in the region of Pisidia, where they will evangelize a Jewish congregation. By the way, I should mention there are a lot of Antiochs in those days. There was one, uh, one uh, leader, he was a Seleucid, if that means anything to you, uh, who named 16 cities Antioch, after his father, um, Antiochus, but not Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the, you know, the arch criminal that um, we read about in the intertestamental period. So there's a lot of Antiochs. Okay? Now, as I've said in the evenings, we've been studying apologetics. God's call to us to defend the gospel, to give reasons for faith. And we noted that what we say to other people largely depends on the audience. Right? What arguments are we going to use? Well, it depends. And some of the arguments we've been looking at, we, we might not ever use those with the kind of people that we, we talk to, but there are things we will use. And here Luke gives us an example of what it is that Paul and Barnabas argued when they had an audience of Jews, uh, an audience that already was firmly convinced in the existence of God. They believed in Yahweh, you know, the covenant God of Israel. And they also revered, respected, feared him, and listened to his word. They accepted scripture, the, the Old Testament scriptures, as the word of God. Now, as I've already said, this shows us how we might also approach people who have similar beliefs, um, such as nominal Christians. And I think nominal Christians, you, you probably understand, means a Christian who, or a person who says they're a Christian, who takes the title but that's all they have is the title. They don't live the Christian life. They're not really trusting in God. They're not really born again. They might not even go to church, or they might go to church. But they, they really don't love the Lord, and they're really not serving Him. They just think that they're Christians. This may be an approach that we would take to them because we can assume they believe in the existence of God. We can assume that they have some respect for the Scriptures. That would be true of Roman Catholics. They would certainly have these convictions. Some in liberal Protestant churches, you know, there are still those who really don't know their pastor is telling them the Bible really isn't the Bible, you know, it isn't really the Word of God, and that God really doesn't exist. Uh, even in conservative evangelical churches, there are many people who are just Christians in name only, and certainly also in Reformed churches. We're not, we're not immune from that. People join themselves with any particular church doesn't necessarily mean that they really know the Lord. So, there are many who believe in God, who accept the Bible, who are still strangers to His grace, and that's where we might take a text some, somewhat like this, although I think we would start in a different place in the Scriptures, perhaps, than where Paul begins. But what I'd like to do is consider three things from this passage. I do want us to see how Paul does approach the Jews. So, how he argues the gospel to a Jewish audience. I want us to see, us to see that warnings are very much a part 
of the gospel message. There is a very strong warning at the end. And then I want us to see the results of, of just preaching the gospel. God gathers his people together. Now, the first part is going to be by far the longest. The last two are just going to be very brief. So first, let's consider how Paul argues the gospel to a Jewish audience. Now, we've already noted that Paul and Barnabas traveled to Pisidian Antioch. And again, this is not the same Antioch they came from, Antioch in Syria. This is Antioch in Pisidia. But it's a very important city in that region. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue where the Jews faithfully gathered to worship the Lord according to God's commandments, according to the fourth commandment. Remember that um, the Old Testament Sabbath is actually a gift that God gives to his people, isn't it? He actually ordained it at the very end of the creation week after he had created all things. He worked six days and then he rested on the seventh and he was refreshed, so to speak. He, he saw all that he had made. It was all very good. And he blessed that day on which he rested as a day of rest and worship for his people. It was meant to be a blessing. It meant to be a day where his people could gather together. And that's how the Jews used it. Now, it was secondly based on the redemption that the Lord basically brought about when he led his people out of Egypt, remember? While the people were in captivity, they weren't able to observe their Sabbaths, I think is the implication. And as soon as God brought them out of Egypt, he reestablished the Sabbath. And so as we read in the book of Deuteronomy, when he's giving the law again to his people, uh, when he gives the reason for the Sabbath, he says, you were slaves in Egypt and God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Okay, so it was based upon that work of redemption. And then in the New Testament, of course, the Sabbath or that day of rest and worship is now based upon the fulfillment of that type of redemption, that, that uh, redeeming God's people out of Egypt, which was fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. He has, as it were, come into Egypt, which is this world, and he has saved us out of this world. And now we are saved because of what he has done, and so we now observe the day he rose from the dead when he entered into his rest as the day we gather together for worship. And so this is a part of God's people's experience. And actually, it turns out to be a very important way by which Paul and Barnabas can reach the Jews because he knows on the Sabbath they're always going to be gathered together in the synagogue to worship the Lord because they were at least you know, faithful outwardly to the law of God. They had a great respect for God and for His law. The problem was they, they just didn't have Christ, and that's what they are bringing to them. Now, their strategy, as we know, in every city was, first of all, to go to God's old covenant people, the Jews, and then they would reach out to the Gentiles. As Paul's going to remind us here in just a minute, God first made His promises to Abraham and to His children. And so they must be the ones to receive the fulfillment, the news of the fulfillment of that promised first. And so that's where he goes. Now, in this synagogue service, the service begins with the reading of the Law and the Prophets, which was followed by a sermon. And it was the duty of the synagogue ruler or the synagogue elders to select the readers and the speakers for the service. You know, as I was thinking about that, I mean, basically... Somebody gets up to read, well, you know, it's already, it's already, the text is already there. All you have to do is read it. That's pretty easy. And then the synagogue rulers are looking around for any traveling uh, rabbi. Hey, you got something to say? Why don't you get up here and say it? That's the sermon for the day, right? How easy to be able to, to regulate worship because perhaps on numerous occasions they didn't necessarily have to have something prepared. So, in this case, we see somebody invited. As a matter of fact, Jesus was invited to speak in one of the synagogues in his own hometown. And he was the one who did the reading, and he was the one who did the speaking. And at the end of it, they dragged him out of the synagogue and over to the edge of a cliff, and they were going to throw him over. That's how well they liked his sermon. I, I thank you. I I'm thankful that, that that hasn't happened here. Okay. So anyway, there are occasions when you read, the person might read and also exposit. But that's what happens here. The reading's been done. They asked if they have a word of exhortation. Now, again, notice the emphasis of their ministry. What are they going to talk about? Well, they're going to talk about Christ. They're going to talk about the forgiveness of sins. 
through faith in Jesus Christ because these Jewish, you know, old, old covenant people of God have been taught to trust in their obedience to the commandments. If you're good enough, God will accept you. Actually, being a child of Abraham, you're good enough. If you've been circumcised, you're good enough. God's accepted you. But no, that's not good enough. It's not good enough to be baptized. That's not enough. You need to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and by His grace have your life transformed that you might serve Him. So that's what they're going to show. Now, again, remember that even though Luke in the, gospel, or in this, in the book of Acts is focusing on just a couple of individuals, uh, whether, well, basically Paul mainly, but you know, Peter a little bit earlier, and maybe Barnabas and, and Silas and, and a few others. Um, he's focusing on what they're doing, showing the progress of the gospel. We need to remember that this very thing is going on throughout. You know, every area that's been evangelized where churches have been planted, they are continuing to reach out, continuing to evangelize. So, how is it that he communicated the gospel? What did he do? Let me just suggest that what he is showing the Jews in this passage are basically these things, that in spite of their unfaithfulness, God is faithful. He kept his promise. He has sent his Messiah. He has fulfilled his word. Okay, that, that's basically what Paul is, is showing. Now, it, it has been said that um, the sermons that are recorded in the book of Acts are actually abbreviated. You know, they're just summaries of perhaps the whole message. Because if this is the whole sermon, I mean, basically Paul preached a five-minute sermon. Now, some of you might like a five-minute sermon. I've been to churches, basically a liberal Lutheran church where the message was 10 minutes long, and everybody liked it, 10 minutes long, a nice little pep talk, you know, and, and really didn't have any gospel content, didn't have any instruction or direction. But basically, talked about how wonderful you are, how wonderful God is, He loves you, and then just kind of go on from there. Well, that's not all the Bible has to say. And I think oftentimes to explain and apply Scripture takes a little bit longer, such as it will on this particular occasion, especially with a sermon that has such a broad scope. Now, we should also bear in mind that because of the audience, okay, the Jews knew all of these things. They, they knew all of this history. So, Paul doesn't have to really dwell on it. They probably get the point, but I want us also to see what the point would be, how it might register in their minds, okay? Now, he begins by addressing the audience, men of Israel, and you who fear God. He's not saying the men of Israel don't fear God, but I hope we understand here he's talking to the Jews and to the God-fearing Gentiles who had joined the synagogue. Like Cornelius, remember? He's a God-fearer. Not a full Jew, wasn't circumcised, so still a Gentile, but a God-fearer, but he would be there in synagogue. He'd be worshiping the Lord too. So he addresses his audience, and then he immediately points to their privileges, to God's grace, to his electing grace in singling out their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to make his covenant with him and with them. Remember, his covenant made with Abraham is the basis of basically... God's plan to send Jesus into the world. There were other promises before that, but that is the first main covenant. So Paul begins in this way. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers. He singled out Abraham to give his Messiah, to give his son through them. Remember what he said to Abraham, through your seed, through your children, one of your offspring all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So this is where essentially we see the promise begin. This is where Paul begins. Next, he reminds them of how God moved them into Egypt. And we don't often think of that as a gracious thing, but let's not forget why he brought them into Egypt. It was to save them from the famine and to preserve them. Uh, it was to basically take care of them while the land he was planning to give to them, inhabited by the Canaanites until the Canaanites basically finished filling up the cup of his wrath. So God was allowing them time, so to speak, to repent, but to finish their transgression so that he could eventually bring his people in, which we'll also see in a moment. But he, he did that, but he also brought his people into Egypt to make them into a great nation, to allow them to multiply so that they could be a great army that would be able to take that land. He brought them into Egypt so that he might spoil Egypt. You know, they left Egypt with all this treasure, and what did they do with it? 
they didn't build nice houses for themselves and, and plush situations, but what they did was they took all that gold and silver and jewels and they built the tabernacle and they built the temple. And he also brought them down into Egypt so that he might destroy Egypt for its sin against him and against his people. And that he might bring his people out of Egypt with a mighty arm and an outstretched hand to glorify his power throughout the world. God did this for his glory. I mean, he did it for many reasons, all of which are gracious. And by the way, it wasn't a picnic for the Israelites in Egypt. You know, it was while Joseph was alive, but not afterwards. Uh, Pharaoh made them <clears throat> basically slaves. This reminds us that God's blessing often means that we must suffer first. We see that with Israel. We see that, I mean, which, which one of the patriarchs didn't suffer? When did Israel not suffer? Job, as we know, suffered. Jesus suffered. Paul suffered. Suffering is a part of life, and God brings blessing out of suffering. That's the way he does it. Now, he brought the Jews out of Egypt through Moses, who was a picture of Jesus, that he might bring them into the land which he had promised to Abraham, which is a picture of the new heavens and the new earth that the Lord is going to give to us through Jesus. When he originally brought them to the border or the boundary of the promised land uh, and they refused to go in because they didn't believe him, Paul tells us that he put up with them in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation died off. And then he brought their children in. So Israel was unfaithful. But God was faithful, still brought them into the land, even though it was their children, he still brought uh, Israel in, okay? He continued his blessings by allowing them to overcome the seven nations of the Canaanites, Paul tells us here. He basically took them out of the land, destroyed them, and gave to his people their land, their houses, their fields, their vineyards. The things he had previously given to the Canaanites, he gave those to his people, so he blessed them. And when they were in the land, remember, he, Paul says they, he, that God raised up judges. Why did he do that? Well, it's because while they were in the land, they were unfaithful to God. And they began worshiping other gods. And so God raised up other nations to chasten them. And when they repented and called out to the Lord, God raised up judges to deliver them. And every single one of those judges was a picture of Jesus Christ. Now, when they finally rejected God and asked for a king... God gave them a king after their own heart. He gave them Saul. But then, as we know, Saul turned out to be a wicked man, and when he rejected Saul and removed him because of his unfaithfulness, he blessed them with a king after his own heart. He gave them David, who is the greatest Old Testament picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does all this mean? It means that God was faithful to move forward with his promises. He was faithful to what he said he was going to do, even though his people were unfaithful. So he didn't bless them because of their faithfulness. He blessed them in spite of their faithfulness because God himself is gracious and he is faithful. Now, Paul sets, sets the scene, okay? Now he wants to move into what does all this mean to them? What has God done actually to fulfill his promise? And that's what he shows them now in Christ. So he begins with David. He says, from David, as he promised that he would seat one of his descendants on his throne and establish it forever, he has given his Savior. He has given the Messiah. John, he sent ahead of time, according to Malachi, he said, I will send out my messenger who will prepare your way. John was sent out to preach and to minister a baptism of repentance to get the people ready. He also pointed to the one who was coming after him, saying that he was not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. This one who was coming after him was much more than a mere man. This one would be God's son. Now, to make sure that, that Paul still has the, uh, his, his audience, their attention, he begins, as he begins to go towards his application, he again addresses them in verse 26. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. In other words, God has fulfilled these promises. He sent his Messiah, Jesus, into the world. Even though the Jews in Jerusalem and their rulers did not understand what the prophets were saying, 
And they did not recognize him and condemned him to death, even though he was innocent, and they handed him over to Pilate for execution. They were actually fulfilling the Scriptures when they crucified him. And they took him down and laid him in a tomb. But here's the main point. God raised him from the dead. Now, this, this is the main evidence. This is the main proof that Jesus was sent from God, that he is the Christ, that the fact that he was raised. We have to remember that God would never raise someone from the dead who had basically falsified his credentials, saying that he was from God when he was actually a false prophet. If that false prophet had been killed, he'd stay in the grave. But the fact that God raised him means that what Jesus said was actually true. He was telling the truth, and his father vindicated him, and that the payment that he said he was making on the cross, giving his life for many, has actually been made, and the father has accepted it. This is the message that basically God, he, he was crucified, he died, he was put in the tomb, but he was raised from the dead. Now, Paul says you don't have to take our word for it. There are many witnesses that Jesus appeared to, and they are everywhere testifying to God's people that the Messiah that you crucified has been raised from the dead. Now, this, he goes on to point out from the Scriptures, is exactly what God said would happen to the Messiah, that he would die, but he would raise his son. Psalm 2, verse 7, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That passage is referred to several times in the Bible to prove the resurrection and that it was going to take place. In verse um, 34, he's quoting again the generality of the prophet saying, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Well, you have to be alive in order to receive those blessings. And then what David wrote in Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. Paul says, David wasn't writing about himself. He says, we know where David's tomb is. If we, if we open it up, we'll find his decaying flesh and bones, what's left of him. Because he was left in the tomb, he did decay, but the one he was speaking of did not, and that is the Christ, the son of David. He was raised from the dead. Now today, if we're going to establish the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can't appeal to ourselves as witnesses, and there's nobody else living today who is a witness but we can appeal to the eyewitness testimony that we have in Scripture. But again, to do that to somebody who has no regard for Scripture, we have to go about it a different way. But if we run into somebody who does have regard for the Scriptures, we just simply need to demonstrate from the Scriptures, from the eyewitness accounts in the Scripture, that that actually took place. Now, Paul goes on. If Jesus is the Christ, what does that mean? What is the application? Well, it means that He alone can forgive your sins. It means that He alone can free you not only from the guilt that would put you into hell forever, but also from the power of sin, from that desire to do the wrong things. Something which Paul tells the, the Jews that the law could not give you the power to do. Remember, that's the reason why the new covenant comes, is because the law written on tablets of stone was not able to give the power actually to do what's written. You know, it doesn't change your heart to read about it. If we wrote the commandments or spray painted them on the side of the wall, that wouldn't help you any further than just enlightening your mind as to what God wants you to do. But it's not going to give you the power to do it. That's the reason why the new covenant comes, because what the law could not do, Jesus is actually able to do. He gives us His Holy Spirit, who gives us the power to obey and so Paul says to them, what you need to do, all you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, which means more than just believing that He existed and that He is who He said he, he was and that He did what He said He was going to do. It means actually to trust Him to save you, to take away your sins, to give you that righteousness, to get you into heaven. The Bible says that if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are by the Holy Spirit placed in Christ united with Christ, and everything that belongs to Him becomes ours. And so when the Father sees us in Christ, He receives us because He sees the perfection of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the point is, as we bring the gospel to others, we need to meet them where, where they are. 
We need to use what they know and are already convinced of to argue to the one that they must come to know if they are to be saved. The fact that somebody believes in God, the fact that somebody has regard for the Bible doesn't mean a thing. It, it certainly is a, it's an advantage. It gives you a head start. But that isn't enough to save you. You know, when I'm listening to people on television, if I want to try to, re, uh, to analyze or figure out whether maybe they could possibly be a Christian or not, it's the people who actually say Jesus that, that I pay attention to. You know, not the ones who say God. Everybody, everybody believes in God. That's a very safe thing to say. But when you say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm trusting Him. Well, only a Christian would dare say that, or at least somebody who, who believes himself to be a Christian. Okay, so we need to meet them where they are. And we always need to remember this too. We need to focus on man's failure. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Jews were trusting in their good works. They were good enough for God to accept them, either by their, their lineage, you know, their physical lineage, their descent from Abraham, or the fact that they were kind of obeying the law of God, going to the synagogues on the Sabbath. But that's not enough to save you, okay? We need to focus on their failure. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but also on God's faithfulness and His grace that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we need to focus on Jesus as the only way, the absolute way, okay, that one can be reconciled with the Father. They have to trust in Him and in Him alone. Okay, so that's the bulk of what we see here. But let me just give you two last things to think about. Paul not only talked about their, their failures and that Jesus is the only way, God's grace and so forth, he also warned them not to reject Jesus. So he concludes with these words, Therefore take heed, beware, what? So that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. Basically, if you scoff at what it is that I'm declaring to you, what God has done through His Son, you will perish, okay? We do need to remind those that we speak with that if they reject Jesus and the salvation He offers they will perish. Okay? Now, remember, they're not going to perish because they're rejecting Jesus. Although it is true, that will make it worse. Okay? They're perishing because of the sins they've committed against God, and Jesus is the only way to get rid of that guilt. But now, having rejected Jesus, that adds to their guilt, and that makes it even worse. Okay? The gospel is not something that we can take or leave. It's not one option among many. And it's certainly not something that we can afford to put off. If we receive Him, we'll be saved. If we reject Him or we take too long in making a choice, halting between two opinions, we will perish. And that doesn't mean burn up and annihilated, but it means going down into hell to suffer forever and ever and ever without any intermission. No relief, okay? That's, Jesus is the only one who makes the difference. And the fact that there is even a way of salvation is because of God's mercy and grace. Now, the last thing I want us to look at is this, and again, very briefly, Luke concludes by giving us the results. What happened, you know, from this exchange? Well, God's grace we see at work here. Many were hungry, and they were saying, I want to hear more. I want to hear more of this. So they were inviting him back to the next Sabbath meeting, the next synagogue meeting. That's always a good sign when people want you back, especially if you're speaking the truth, right? But many also followed Paul and Barnabas. That, that's even better. They didn't want to wait till the next week. They continued to follow and said, teach us more about this Jesus, okay? Now, he also tells us what their counsel was to those who followed. And again, let's pay attention to this because this is really an applicational point for us. He urged them to continue in the grace of God. And even though Paul says this in a different way, what he's saying is the same thing we started with. What he was saying is, if you really trusted Jesus, you need to follow Him, okay? You need to worship Him. You need to minister to Him. 
You need to, again, do the things we, we saw them doing in Antioch so that they might gain strength and direction so that they would be able to do what the Lord calls them to do. And you know what? There, there's one thing about Paul's testimony that um, doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense that I read in 1 Corinthians 9, and sometimes it comes as a shock to us when we think about it. But Paul says, basically, he had to beat his body and make it his slave, lest after he had preached to others, he himself would basically be cast away. In order for him to be a partaker of the gospel, he had to fulfill this work of beating down his flesh and doing what the Lord Jesus called him to do. And it almost sounds like, oh, wait a minute, Paul wasn't even sure of his own salvation or there's something Paul had to do in order to reach heaven. Well, the fact is, uh, Paul was saved by the grace of God like anyone else. But what he was pointing to, he says, if I do not do what the Lord calls me to do, if I don't fight against my flesh, if I don't do what he calls me to do with regard to this, this stewardship that's entrusted to me, I'll end up being cast away because I will prove myself not to be a believer at all. Okay? When we don't do what the Lord calls us to do, it just shows we don't know Him. I mean, that, that's what the Bible says. If we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, we're not going to be, you know, lukewarm. We're not going to be cold, but we're going to be hot. We're going to be zealous for Him. There's going to be times when we do get cool, and when that happens, the Lord's going to spur us on. There may be times when we get to the very edge. The Lord isn't going to let us drop, but we're not going to live on the edge our whole lives. We're going to be seeking the Lord, okay? That's what true believers do, not because somebody is standing over them, writing them all the time, but it's because that's what their heart dictates, because the Spirit of God within us is giving us that desire. This is what we call experiential Christianity. You know, it's not just a belief system. It's an experience. It's a life. It's something that we should be experiencing in our own lives and hearts. There should be a love in our hearts for Christ a genuine affection for Him that, as Jonathan Edwards would say, moves us beyond, you know, beyond just indifference. You know, it's, it's not something that moves us just barely beyond indifference, but something that is characterized in Scripture as hot, okay, hot. So we need to think about our experience in light of that. How do we get hot? Well, it's only by warming, as it were, the hearth of our hearts at the altar of God by worshiping Him as He calls us to worship Him. That's the only way we can get it. If we want the strength of God, if we want the guidance that we need to be faithful to Him, we have to do these things. Part of you know, beating the flesh or buffeting the flesh, as Paul says, is using the means of grace because that's how we do it. That's how we beat it back. That's how we gain God's strength. That's how we walk with the Lord. Well, let's, let's take a moment, shall we, and, and bow in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to um, just to receive what it is He's told us. And uh, in just a moment, I'll read a passage of Scripture to prepare us for the, for the Lord's table. So let's take just a moment in prayer.